Don't go anywhere. Let's give them a hand. This is Homestead Collective. I love you guys. You are, I love working with you. Uh, if you, Shelton family, if you are interested in financially backing a really amazing ministry in Glenside, talk to them after the service because they got some really exciting stuff going on in the Glenside area. So thanks, y'all. Okay, now you can go. <laughs> hey, good morning. I'm Jim. Uh, the first Sunday of Advent. Woo! Woo! Are you ready? You're ready. Are you ready for Christmas? Yeah, yeah. In the first service, all the kids were like, yay! And the parents were like, oh. The first Sunday of Advent needs a pop quiz. You ready for a pop quiz? All right. Here's the question. Who is the most cynical, pessimistic, grumpy, bad attitude Christmas character of them all? Scrooge, Grinch, it's a toss-up, really it is. It's a toss-up for me between Scrooge and Grinch, mostly because, well, Scrooge McDuck. <laughs> Scrooge McDuck is my favorite of all the Scrooges. Um, but mostly because I was, I was just at Disney World, and Disney World really brings out the bah humbug in me. <laughs> but it actually makes me a Grinch. Okay, yeah, so, so let's go with Grinch. Um, this is, this is what I look like standing in line for an 110 minutes hemorrhaging money for a, for a ride that closes right before I get there. It really happened. Disney. No, actually, that was Universal. Um, they're the same. They're the same. All right, so next question. Who is the most... Blindly optimistic, happy attitude, optimist, Christmas, Christmas character of them all. Elf. Elf. Hands down. It's Elf. It's Elf. While I was in line for 110 minutes, my heart shrank 12 sizes that day. And then when we were trying this on, your, 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 suit, your suit was 12 sizes too small. <laughs> Elf, yes. So odds are you're somewhere between, and on the, on the pessimism, optimism spectrum, you're somewhere between these two characters, right? You're somewhere between the Grinch, Grinchy, and the Elf, Elfy person. <laughs> You should have seen the Target guy that we got to take that picture. <laughs> I came around the corner and I was like, hey, and I was Grinch, and he jumped and, and cursed me. It was an accident, but anyway. So odds are you're somewhere between uh, the pessimist and the optimist. Um, and as you can see, I'm a little bit more Grinchy than, than a lot of people, but you, you elfy people uh, don't judge because with your uncautiously optimistic attitude, whatever that means, and your everything is awesome, everything is cool when you're part of the team <laughs> attitude. Uh, look, look, it, it, it's, it's basically the same for both. We have, we have our interactions where, uh, where we navigate life either pessimistically or optimistically. We tend toward one or the other. Um, but the reality is, life is way more complex than oversimplifying optimist and pessimist uh, in your life. So, so both have this temptation to, uh, to see the world incompletely. All right, so, so we have our way of, of navigating hardship and disappointment, the, the optimistic way or the pessimistic way, but both of them, the results are the same. We watch too much Netflix or we we buy too much furniture and spend our time rearranging it in our house, or we, uh, we spend our money on drugs, legal drugs or illegal drugs, and in, any other kind of destructive habits that we, that we may have. The result is the same. So, so pessimists get there this way. Pessimists are tempted to think that the world is basically bad, that people are basically bad. 
Um, they build walls of cynicism and sarcasm to protect themselves, to guard themselves from getting duped. And that's the key word for pessimists. They don't want to get duped, okay? So they, they guard themselves by, uh, fr from being burned because they've been duped before and they don't want to get duped again. So the race to, to find the worst possible thing that could happen and, and get there and not be surprised when, when it happens. That's what pessimists do, right? I knew that would happen, okay? But honestly, the result, the result is despair. All you can do is despair because, because if you really take the world seriously, you're overwhelmed by the brokenness and sinfulness and, and misery of, of, of life. And it's only, pessimism is only going to naturally and logically lead you to despair. Optimists, on the other hand, they're tempted to think that the world is basically good, that people are basically good. So they protect themselves from suffering and hardship by ignoring the facts around them. They, they minimize the gravity of whatever hard situation that they're in. Denial is their best friend, right? Optimists live in the fantasy that they can control suffering and hardship by disengaging it, disengaging from it, okay? And that's the result. You can't handle it, so you disengage, all right? But the, the result is a, a surface level, uh, or a little like below the surface anxiety that's always just kind of there. And you have to put on your smile and sing, everything is awesome, even though things may not really be. But you have to disengage because the world is way more broken and messed up than we can handle. So, so how do you do it? In the face of hardship and brokenness and suffering of the world, how do you, do you, do you despair or do you disengage? Because what the world needs is a humble people who are courageous enough to honestly look at the world, honestly look at life, and then diligently work to build something good. No more deconstructing, no more despair, no more giving up, no more checking out, no more disengagement. What the world needs is people who have genuine hope. So we're gonna try and figure out how we can navigate these two things, how we can go, how hope can guide us through neither, neither despair nor disengagement. We're gonna to need to go to, to Isaiah 11. Okay, so if you have a Bible, turn with me to Isaiah 11, but let me pray as we get there. You can, you can turn there while I'm praying. Uh, Lord Jesus, we, we love you, and we, we pray that you would fill this place with your spirit and joy of our salvation as we sit, sit with you to, to hear of your glory and your grace. So may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing to you as we sit before you, knowing that you are gracious and you are kind, and you are full of love. We pray these things in your name. Amen. All right, Isaiah 11 says this, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his, around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat and the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, and their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, and the infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. And they will neither harm nor destroy on my holy mountain. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his resting place will be glorious. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's make some observations about Isaiah 11. It's a poem. It's an ancient poem. 
The main image of this poem is, is a stump of a, of a tree that's been cut down with a baby tree growing out of it. This isn't just any stump. This is the stump of Jesse. It's called the stump of Jesse from Jesse's tree. Jesse was the father of David. David was the king, the greatest king that Israel ever knew. He's the, the one on whom all the hopes and, and dreams and, and of a national identity rested on, on this king, where, where Israel, under the king, under the great king, would be a place of peace and justice, a haven for, uh, for the nations to come and find, find rest and find shade. But, but Israel rebelled against God and fell short of that job to be a haven for the nations, a haven of justice and mercy. Uh, now they're reaping the consequences of their rebellion, and things are really are worse than, than the best pessimist could, uh, could imagine. Isaiah is making predictions about how the nation of Assyria is going to invade Israel and, and take over and cut down this tree so that the kingly line would end and all the hopes, promises of God would end. So this is an image of despair. And, and, and Isaiah knows that they're discouraged and that there's uh, confusion. So as Isaiah gives them this poem, he says, he, he understands that, it, that Israel is going to say things like this, like, wait, we hoped that we would be a royal priesthood. Wait, we hoped that, we had hoped that, that God would keep his promises. We had hoped that everything would be amazing when, when God would build his kingdom. We had hoped, but now our hopes are being dashed. Now our hopes and dreams are like cut down trees. Okay, so that's, that's the context of this poem of, of dashed and, and broken, cut down trees. Now, I know that you children, you kids can understand this. I want you to imagine your favorite cake, your favorite kind of cake. It's probably Trader Joe's dark chocolate ganache cake <laughs> in a little container like this that is easily eaten in one sitting. You don't feel good afterwards. Imagine that, that that cake is sitting on the counter waiting to be your after school snack. And after a long day of going to all your classes and, and doing all your homework, you come home expecting to feast on said cake and you see that someone has eaten the entire thing and left the empty container. <laughs> what do you do? What do you do? Do you, do you despair? Do you disengage? Do you, are you sad? Are you angry? Do you throw a temper tantrum? Do you say, yeah, all of this. Do you say, we had hoped that this family would be a little bit more generous and diligent in, in sharing the cake with everyone. And do your parents say, all right, get over it. Well, okay, kids, parents have their own kind of chocolate cake. All right, it may even be chocolate cake. Um, but it's also relationships and other expectations like, like a good job and and hopes and dreams for you, your children, their children. It could be any number of things. And when grown-ups don't get their way, grown-ups throw grown-up temper tantrums. And grown-ups say the same thing. We had hoped that, and you fill in the blank. So we can all relate to what it means to, to have our hopes dashed. So how do you navigate? How do you navigate disappointment? You've been duped before. We all have. Do you despair or do you disengage? Or do you risk maintaining hope in the midst of that? It's like when you, you, you've had these like, really deep longings and desires and hopes. 
in your heart. And they're really strong, but they're really fragile. And when and it, you kind of don't even want to tell anybody because you're afraid you might jinx it or something, or you, you're afraid that if someone finds out that they may have a hand in destroying those dreams. And you just, you're too, it's too much of a risk to even say what your desire and your dream is, and you keep it hidden deep, deep down inside. But life moves forward, and these dreams start to, to show themselves like, like things could come to fruition, like this could actually happen. You know, maybe, maybe it's you finally met someone and you never thought you would, but deep inside. And they're great. They're better than you thought. Or you finally found that job that, man, this is right. This is too good to be true. Or, or your exam scores came back and they're actually high enough to where you could get into the school that you've always wanted to go to. Or the, the pregnancy test finally showed positive. Do you dare risk hoping? It really seems like God's behind this. Do you take the risk and, and show a little hope? The tree that Isaiah is talking about represents all of your expectations, hopes, and dreams. You cultivate it. You you let it grow, you tend, you tend it and care for it, and you, and you watch it flourish. And then in a moment, maybe it's because of something that you did or maybe because of something someone else did, in a moment, that hope or that dream gets chopped down. And you get duped again. We all know what it feels like to have our hopes dashed. Your dreams may look like a forest full of cut down trees. I know mine. I know mine do. It makes it really hard to let another dream grow. It makes it really hard to risk being hopeful. I get it. It's way easier to check out, way easier to be cynical and, and despair. It's way, way easier to just disengage from things and watch some Netflix. But both ways will only end to misery. So you sit, you sit in devastation, and you say, we had hoped, we had hoped that it would be different. We had hoped, but our dreams have been dashed. You hope, but it's, it's actually here, out of this, out of this cut down tree, that, that leaves room for something else to grow. And that's what, that's what the, the image from Isaiah is, is all about. It's what the rest of the passage is about. Right? You have this stump, and then out of that is, is this fruitful new tree, something growing out of the devastation. It's something more glorious than, than you can imagine. And it's, it's so glorious that it actually requires poetry to, to describe. So, so the rest of Isaiah 11 is, is this poetry describing the spirit of the Lord that will rest... Um, that will rest on the Savior, the Messiah. And he will be wisdom. He will be justice. He will be rightness. He will bring peace, not just to humans, but to all creation, so that creation will no longer groan, but will obey humans again, like an infant who tells a cobra what to do. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord, and we will look to the root of Jesse, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, as the consolation of Israel. So in the middle of the death of our hopes and dreams, God promises something better. Are we willing to risk hoping in him? It's kind of like we say, Jesus, if, if when you come, you're going to make everything right again, right? No wonder this... Isaiah 11 is a wonderful and famous Christmas passage. From, from this point on, from, Isaiah, from Isaiah's prediction on, it's, it's, a, it's as if Israel sat in front of that stump waiting with longing and expectation, looking at any second, there could be a little, a little shoot that comes up. It could be the declaration that hope has finally come. And that's when, in Luke 2, when, when Jesus comes on the scene as, as we celebrate Christmas, we see this sense of longing and, and expectation and a buzzing energy that something amazing is about to happen. 
You see it embodied in the, in the passage that we read earlier today from Luke 2 about Simeon and Anna. Simeon and Anna are waiting with hope. Neither overwhelmed with the despair of cynicism or disengaged by naive optimism. Anna was married for seven years, and then she was a widow until the day, until she was 84. Talk about cut down dreams. But God gave them a vision, a promise, and Simeon cultivated that. Simeon and Anna cultivated that dream, and they were faithful, and, and they waited with hope that God would fulfill the promise. And Simeon, Simeon got to hold the baby Jesus, the, 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 the object of his hopes and dreams, got to literally hold his hopes. So, so that's why we, we light the Advent candle. We, we say we want to be like Simeon and Anna. And we want to declare that our hope is in Jesus. We want to be like them. But honestly, when I read beautiful passages like Luke 2, the cynic, the Grinch, kind of starts to rear its ugly head. And, and I go, yeah, but Simeon, you never had your hopes dashed. You don't know. You don't know that my life is a forest of cut down trees. You don't know the disappointments and, and, and sorrows that I've faced. Good for Simeon, good for you, man. You got to hold Jesus. It's risky to trust in God with our strong but fragile hopes. That's why we have to keep preaching the gospel to ourselves. The gospel, the story of the gospel is is more deeply tragic than the best cynic can pessimistically deconstruct everything to absolute nihilistic despair. It's more deeply tragic than that. But it's also way more glorious than any optimist could fathom. But it's in that order. It's death and then resurrection. The death of your hopes and dreams gives room, this is key, the death of your hopes and dreams gives room for the resurrection of something better. Our life is one long, continuous cycle of the death of dreams that are just too small and the resurrection of dreams that are better, all so that God can begin weaving in his desires for your life. Because ultimately, what you really want is fellowship with God. Ultimately, what you want, what you hope for, is God himself. And only Christianity can say with an undaunted hope that this world is, is more broken and messed up than we can imagine. But God's grace is more victorious and beautiful than we could ever imagine. Because Jesus died in the absolute agony of despair in our place. There's no more cynical and despairing phrase than this. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus himself, the second person of the Trinity, God, said that. But Jesus rose again. He rose from the dead. And that hope is, a, is real for us now because what resurrection means is that the story of the gospel is more glorious than, than we can imagine because resurrection is real now. It guarantees that whatever cut down dream you've experienced, there will be something better. There will. But the hope isn't just a future hope. The, the hope is a now hope. Okay? This is something that you get now, like right now. Not when we leave, but like right now. In John 14, Jesus says to his disciples in the upper room, he says, I will send to you a helper, an advocate. I will send to you the Holy Spirit, the parakletos is the Greek word, the one who comes alongside. Parak, uh, parakleo is the one who comes alongside. That's the same word that Luke 2 uses when Simeon says that he was waiting for the consolation. That's the parakleo. He's waiting for the consolation of Israel. What are we talking about there? It's the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? It means that God is with us now. God comes alongside now. So those who are united to him, get him now. God with us. God in us by his Holy Spirit. Do you believe that? Does your life look like you believe that? 
Do you see Jesus moving in your hopes and dreams? Do you see him? Do you see him? Do you experience him when your hopes are dashed? It's really hard to see Jesus with us. It's really hard to see Jesus when our hopes are dashed. That's why I love this story from Luke 24. Uh, the, the two really discouraged men who are walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus on the very day, the very afternoon of Jesus' resurrection. And the women who first bore witness to the resurrection of Jesus, they have told this guy, these guys, they've told them that Jesus is alive. They've, they've said that the tomb is empty. We've seen him. But come on. That's ridiculous. So they, they can't believe it. They disengage from, from the story and they walk home in despair. It's ridiculous to think that the root of Jesse, the savior, the Messiah, would have to die. That's ridiculous. But that, that he would die and then rise again, that's absurd. It's audacious for them to, to believe. It's audacious for them to think that that's that the women are telling the truth. They don't want to get, they don't want to get duped again. Because on Friday, man, they got duped. All of their hopes and dreams died on a tree. So do they risk having, having hope? Well, this is what I love about this story. These guys are walking in despair, and Jesus comes alongside. But they don't recognize him. They don't see him because it's really hard to see Jesus in the midst of your cut down hopes and dreams. So as Jesus is, is walking alongside them, he explains to them, yeah, this is, the Messiah has to die. The Messiah had to die and then rise again. And, and they get it, but they're starting to get it and understand it. And they're really curious still, but they don't recognize him. They still don't rec recognize him. Not in, 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 in fact, they, in their despair, they say the very words that we've been saying. They say, and they're talking to Jesus. This is what's wonderful about this. We had hoped that he would be the one to redeem Israel. We had hoped. We had hoped that he would be the root of Jesse, the one who would rescue us. We had hoped. But our hopes are dashed. As Jesus walks with them, they sit down to a meal. They still don't recognize him. Not until verse 30, it says this. Jesus took the bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, he gave it to them. And their eyes were open. And they saw him. This is the one we've waited for. This is our hope. Here he is, risen from the grave. And we met him at the meal. So let's do the same. Let's go to the table and meet with Jesus. I'll invite the ushers up to help us serve and as I pray. Lord Jesus, we want to give to you. We want to submit to you our, our, our longings, our hopes, our dreams. We want to give them to you and we want to say, say, give us you. We want you. Give us yourself in such a way where our lives are changed. It's really hard to see you. So we come to the table and we say, we are hungry and thirsty for righteousness and we want to taste and see that you are good. So bless us now, we pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, life everlasting. Amen.